Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Yeah. You're in the year 5778, right? Which is, oops. There we go. We're going to go into that a little bit more here, but um, I want you to notice something. Do you know what this is a picture of? It's a, actually an artist's rendering because they haven't gotten it that fully executed yet. This is the brand new aircraft carrier that is the uh, Gerald R. Ford. This is, they did this rendering before um, they actually built it to give people a good idea of what it was. And one thing I want you to note, this is, this is the state-of-the-art carrier. We've talked about it a little bit, but they've increased the deck space. They only have three lifts instead of the four. It's got twice the power. It actually takes fewer crew. Instead of a steam catapult, it's got an electromagnetic catapult. Wow. And, and so that it actually is less stressful on the planes to launch, okay? The, the reason this is, we've been watching this and, and following it from the point that it was first christened and then commissioned and now it's out in the water and they're continuing to outfit it's got like a million miles, I don't know how many miles, thousands of miles of fiber, uh, fiber optic cables run through it. It is built in with increased flexibility so it can adapt to what the needs are. But one thing that's really interesting, do you notice the number of it? 78. 78. So the number right there on the hull, see the red circle? It's CVN, which stands for Carrier Vehicle, Carrier Vessel Nuclear. It's CVN 78. So I have been watching this just in alignment, and it will come fully online in this next calendar year. Okay? They've got to do some more tests on the things, but it'll be fully operational in that. And so that is our model. You all know that, right? The carrier. And so you all have landed in here, sort of, you know, and you're getting recalibrated and getting some repair work done, Lord willing, by his grace, whether it's hips or hearts or whatever you got, hard heads. Um, he's going to go after it. We want to get you armed and briefed because this isn't the deal. The deal is where you need to be out there, right? But one thing, and I won't talk more about it tonight other than to say this, I've been, um, the, the current pictures of CVN 78, the, the Gerald R. Ford, you don't see any, virtually any planes on, it's just the deck coming and going. In fact, I sent out a little ping thing when you all met. By the way, thank you to Gail for helping to host and pull that together. And Jean Jack could not be here today, uh, tonight but heard phenomenal things. I was very excited about that because it's critical we get that there's, is the presence of God isn't dependent on a person or a place, right? And so we gotta shift it. It's about the move. But the, here's what's critical. I've come to understand more and more that the flight deck itself, that space, which is four and a half acres in millions of square miles of ocean. So finding that, you gotta know where it is. But what that's made up for us, and the reason you can land, is honor and freedom. We honor you wherever you are in your walk with the Lord. You may not think like this is for you. That's fine. We honor where you are, and we give you the freedom to do that. We honor who Christ is in you specifically. We want you to move in His glory, not in anything we're trying to do, right? It's, it's unique. It's individualized. And so I've just been thinking about that more than more, that the platform that we have. And so when I talked with Gail and with Jean beforehand, it was kind of like, just, just create and maintain that atmosphere of honor, okay? And we honor the king, and so we can honor each other because he is unique in his reflection in each of us. Okay, so, Father, I thank you right now for what you're doing here and what you want to do. And Lord, I just submit anything that I put together here, and I just throw it in the trash bin as far as I'm concerned. It's, this is about you and what you want to do. Breathe life into these, your people. In the name of Jesus. You know, some of you, I was, we were gone um, last week to a conference. We celebrated the new year um, out there in Texas. And a lot of great insight and discernment and revelation, good meetings and connections. But I have to sort it out. And I am in the middle of just being overwhelmed with revelation. And so when it comes like a time like tonight, it's a little bit hard. But I, I want to link you back to this. Let me show you this. This was a quote. When we were commissioned, Kim and I were commissioned by Chuck and Peter and Doris Wagner out of Glory of Zion in 2012, I think it was, something like that. Can't remember the exact year. And Levi was there too. And after Chuck had prayed over me and released something over Levi, and um, Doris had prayed over Kim because of the deliverance aspect, then Chuck loosed this, which, you know, I didn't know he was going to do any of this stuff. 
Lord, we loose the prophetic anointing and the seer anointing, and we say it will create a watchman apostolic realm that has not been seen in this area in Jesus' name. Yes. I need you to understand that it was about, it wasn't so much about us, it was about the anointing being released for a realm here, for an influence, for an impact, so that there be a, a watchman apostolic anointing. And it's connected to the prophetic and the seer. The seer is going to be some of the prophetic, but you're going to see, have pictures, visualize what that is, and then speak out of that. Okay? And so we move very much in that, and the reason I want to connect the dots for you with that is that you, I use a lot of these pictures, right? Because I understand how now how God imprints. That when he had the first Torah put together, right, it, it wasn't words as much as it was pictograms, right? Those are all pictures, and I love the saying from some of the old rabbis, when the Messiah comes, he will not only explain to us the meaning of the letters, he will explain the meaning of the space between them. You know, there's such a reverence of understanding, and that's why these have to be perfect when they're done, without correction, without error. But they're pictograms, they're pictures, and God is imprinting, and, and you know, you can be around, and so our problem in our Greek mindset, we want this abstract word and then we want to do it, and God would rather go, let me give you a picture. And then, you know, and there's still interpretations on the, t on the picture, just like there are on the word. But it's, it's, it's even more dynamic in terms of how it moves. So we track with that, and we understand that we're both in the world, but we're not also of the world. So, for instance, did most of you take a shower today? Okay, the ones who didn't are way in the back. Thank you very much. It's kind of you. Check your flies at the door. No, okay, those are, okay. Yes. And you know, we need that and we agree with that, but then there's this daily cleansing of being washed with the water of the word, right? And you understand, you move in the world, so you shower, because otherwise you won't move in the world very well. But you've got to understand too, you have to be washed by the water of the world, word, and, and it washes over you. Similarly, you understand standard time, right? I mean, we said we're gonna start at seven and most of you guys got that. Some of you still, you know, just like, okay. But, we also move in covenant time. And so while we're in the standard time that's called 2017, we're in covenant time, this is the year 5778. Now, because we've been grafted into all those promises, all those word pictures back given in Hebrew when God imprinted that and entrusted it to the Jews, we want to walk and say, okay, God, what are you saying by this? And in covenant time in that year, oops, sorry, I'm going to give you this one little transition. Because we're in now the seventh month, and I'm not going to get into the confusion of the new year, but why is it the seventh month? We'll do that another time. Other than to say, when did the year start in this calendar, for, for in the Gregorian calendar? January. January, right? When did the school year start? Okay, wait a minute. That's stupid, right? Wait a minute. You got two different calendars running at the same time? Yes. We do it all the time. God does it too, so let's just bypass that. But the seventh month, what is this? What's that right there? Fire hydrant, right? Seventh month is like this. It's like trying to take a sip out of a fire hose. Because there's so much coming, there's so much revelation because there's new things about the year, there's things about this month, it's the seventh month, it's the seventh tribe, which is the tribe of Ephraim. I'm not even gonna talk about that tonight, but know this, that Ephraim gets the double blessing. And he doesn't even deserve it. He is the second born, but when it comes time for the blessing, Jacob, also known as Israel, switches his hands. Are you, you up for a double blessing? Do you need a double blessing to get you rolling in this? Okay, absolutely. Okay, so I want you to just hold on to that. So you came by last Thursday, and actually it was Wednesday night at sundown, was the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Terah. That's also Rosh Hashanah, which is the new year. Rosh Hashanah means head of the new year. So 57, 78, and right now we're in the 10 days of awe that's between that and then this Saturday will be the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And then there's this little mini break and prep because then you move into Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. So there's all this stuff going on and we could talk about any one of those all night. And that's the problem. Because you can't deal with that. I can't deal with that. So the question is how much do I try to give you? Let me just you all have seen some of this before. How many of you have seen this? If not, I'm just going to take you briefly. The Tabernacle of Moses shows the main feasts. The three main are Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Those are three groupings. 
There's three, one, and three. And so the altar and sacrifice, the fire and water out there, the seven light lampstand, the bread, the show bread, the incense that's offered up, you have the Ark of the Covenant and what sits on top of that but the mercy seat. And then of course the veil's gotta be between there. Right, you get this? Okay, the progression we go through is that the blood has gotta be released there at the altar in Passover, but also back here in the mercy seat on atonement, almost exactly six months apart. God is making a very clear, clear point. And when we celebrate the feast, we go Passover. That really s brings us together about going through the fire, that bird sacrifice, the sacrifice, sacrificial lamb, and then going through the water as in baptism. When you move into the inner courtyard, now you're moving into that greater depth of provision, greater depth of understanding of the word of the Holy Spirit being given on Pentecost. And when you get through to tabernacles now, the high priest is pressed in, right, into the Holy of Holies. And so it's this process that we're to go through every year and we cycle back around. And so the issue is that I keep talking about is that God years ago showed me it was just like a marriage. For a man shall leave his woman and oh, for a man shall leave his woman. Let me try that again. Boy, you're a tough crowd. I was doing really well till then. What? Yeah, Kim always told me, she said, the only thing is if you ever leave me, you just have to know one thing, I'm going with you. <laughs> I was like, okay, never been an issue. For a man shall leave his home and a woman shall leave, a man shall leave his father and mother, a woman leave her home and cleave and the two shall become one. So the leave, cleave, become one. It's a one-time process, but it's also an annual commitment to go back to this again. There's always more areas of our old stuff we gotta leave behind. Always new areas where we understand how we cleave together and a deeper way in which we become one. And so it's really just the same thing. Our process with the Lord is that same thing. We leave in the first section. We understand in terms of Passover. The cleaving is out Mount Sinai. It's through the giving of the Holy Spirit. The becoming one is really a deep focus for me in this final set of feasts. And it's an ongoing process, but the challenge is, is that most of the church is stuck back out there in the leave. If they've left at all, right? They've gone through a one-time kind of thing, and then it's like, okay, God, I'll see you when I get to the gates. And unfortunately, God's gonna have to say, yeah, you will. But I don't know that I'll recognize you. I can only say that because Jesus said, then he will say to them, I never knew you. And that's to some people who said, hey, didn't we do mighty miracles in your name? So the challenge again is that the blood gets applied twice so that we're constantly aware of the sacrifice of Jesus and how it's brought into both places in order to not only break us free, but bring us into the deep connection, heart connection, life connection that we need with the Father. But this is always the danger zone because people get nervous about that kind of intimacy with a God that that's big and dangerous, right? We'd rather just keep him a little bit of distance. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Right? Okay. You remember the Pharisee spray. Particularly not like this guy. And the tax collector, right? Just beat his chest. Have mercy. Drawing the intimacy of the Father through that. So, one quick review again. Feast of Trumpets was September 21st. It was the head of the year. We're now in the days of awe. We come into the atonement. We're going to get to that. We refresh the relationship. It's anchored and sustained by the blood. And Tabernacles, which is going to be the 5th through 11th of October. What it really is, is remembering that we are still on the move because it's so easy to get stuck and that the God's glory is with us, right? So this is, to me, is just an incredible time of year. I, I don't know why. This is... This is my favorite time of the feasts, even though we don't do something big like Passover per se, right? Where you have the whole Seder and everything, because I think it's like, okay, it's, it's been building for this. This is where it really comes together. So just like in a relationship, in this little part of it, this, this fall feast, the wake up is trumpet, the days of awe are really about a time of about, okay, think about your relationship. How's it going? It's very easy to take a marriage for granted, correct? Okay, some of you are here as the result of someone taking it for granted. Okay, you have to attend to relationships. 
And so sometimes you just need a wake up call. Then you've got to consider your ways. And then when you understand, you have to deal with the issues. These steps are right in this fall feast situation. And then you can dwell together. And so the blood's got to come in here because ultimately that veil is there, right? It's got to break off the rest. Because really what Tabernacles is, there's a break between it. It's a celebration party. It is just a rock out party. That's what it's supposed to be. It really is, okay? Because look, you've done, we woke you up. We gave you 10 days to consider well your ways. Now the priest has gone in behind the veil. It's good. Hey, right? And so we're, we're moving now and we're in this just about on the cusp of the time of atonement. And so the challenge again is I got thinking about the church and largely they see the blood in this as a get out of jail free card, right? Oh, wow, I was going to hell, now I'm not. Yay! <laughs> and God's like, you know what? It's, it's more, it's a full access pass. But you know, the reality is the price has been paid, but the fact is, is that very few will actually cash it in. Okay? In part because they rather slumber than confront the issues and get the reconciliation done so they can become more one. But God brings the blood in both places in getting us out of Egypt, getting us out of bondage, but then giving us full access up into the presence. Okay, you good with that? I'm just kind of, okay, 57, 78. Let me show you some things that we talked about briefly. Eight is a number of what? Oh, come on, one more time. What? There you go. Okay, just remember that. We, we going into the detail on some of that. Noah, when new beginning, when he comes out, there are eight in that. It's mentioned in 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And it's het or hate. It depends upon how it's got the, uh, the vowel markings, you know, under the Hebrew letter. Sometimes it's easier to say het, 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 het. Say het. Hanukkah. There you go, okay? Yeah, I know. You just hairball it, okay? We, Dave Richards isn't here tonight, our, our vet, you know, and so he could get us a real good hairball going on this. Okay, but the way that you make it in modern Hebrew today is that you take a vav, which is the number six, which is connected in with the person, of course, of humanity, and then the number seven, which is a crowned vav. If you have crowned humanity, who does that represent? Jesus, right. And what you do here is you yoke the two together. And I can't get away from the power of that for this year. Because there's a lot of stuff that you will hear spoken about gates and everything else. But my question is not just a what, but a how. Okay, you're telling me there are these gates. Now, how do I enter into that? What's the process? And so that's kind of what I keep going after. So this is how you'll see it written in a lot of the scrolls. And it turns into modern Hebrew looking like this. Now, can you see the gate in that? Very clearly, right? Now, originally, the letter of this, the number eight, if you took that eight and put it on a side almost, or almost left it right like that, it looked like a fence. Because originally, it was a picture of a barrier in between a tent, or a wall, or a protection, or a divider. All that's going to fit into the idea of new beginning. But here is the most prominent word in all of Scripture. Hi. Say hi. Hi. Life. Did you pay attention to those songs tonight about life? You make me come alive, okay? And then it was about also about coming into the holy of holy, right? There was stuff about coming in. So we're just trying to stir up that reality. And it's high, it means life or to live or to be alive. Here's a verse. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. That's the first use of the word high. Actually, it's used earlier, but for connection, I want to just give you with that. You got it? Here's another one. Haya. Yeah, it sounds like, yeah, like when I did martial arts. Haya. Okay. Haya. Say haya. Okay, it's related to that. It means living, alive, saved, quick, and here. Now, Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe that you may live. Haya. Now, the reason I do this is because, see, every year, the, the, the Hebrew letters, 57, 78, are all letters. Rather, those numbers are a letter. And that number eight is this. Well, it's not haya. It's just the letter. <laughs> okay? And so what you do, you always look for firsts. If I want to understand Mike and Jackie's kids, I'm going to first look to Mike as the father. Okay? I'm just, that's how it moves. Who are, we're the, who are the three fathers that, that we follow after? The God of... 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, it always, first, 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 always says this. When you get into Hebrew, you go first letter. By the way, have you ever gone somewhere and you had to register? How do they find your registration? How do they have it sorted? Alphabetical. Alphabetical. They understand that there's something by the first letter and now you're in the family of that one, okay? And you're gathered in that. Hebrew does the same thing, but God associates these things together. It's the fathering character of the rest of them. So this number eight comes into those two in the first place. But there are a lot of words. Every year I go through and study all the Hebrew words that are associated with that first letter because we use those as prophetic triggers. We just say, okay, is God pointing, given it's his covenantal calendar, 5778, it's the eight that's changed. Is there places there I can just look in the scriptures and see what he might be saying? Do you think that God is in covenantal time? Do you think that God wants his people to understand what he's doing? Yes. Okay. Now, bottom line, even if I was completely wrong, the worst thing I'm going to do is direct you into scripture. And it's not going to be based on my impulse. It's because I think there's a prophetic trigger. We are a prophetic and a seer-based house, right, to set up a watchman. A watchman is someone who watches, takes a look, sees what's coming, apostolic realm so that we help to send people and align with what we understand God to do. So I do watch the stuff that's going on in the news. I do try to watch what's, and I try to understand it by the biblical passages and points. We've done this every year. How many of you have been tracking with us for three, four, or five years? Okay. Have you seen this walk out? Yes. Okay. It just becomes a set of lenses by which you, you begin to see and understand, and it always directs you back to the Word, back to the Word, back to the Word, back to the Word. Last year, we came through the year of the sword, right? Zion is at number seven. And we just paid attention to where that was, the way things were getting divided and separated and on and on and on. And you just watch these things. And what it does, it brings you back to the word and you have a deeper understanding so you can look at the storminess and go, okay, that's really not that surprising. Right? Yeah, okay, okay, that's not. And so what it does is it gives you a perspective and a peace in the midst of the craziness. Has the craziness increased? Do you need a new beginning? Yes. Okay. I think there are new beginnings going to be available to us all this year. Amen. And I think it's going to be up to us to discern them and then move through it. Amen. Some of you are walking out new beginnings now. Some of you are already worn out from them. <laughs> so you're going to need a new beginning for the new beginning. I'm not sure what to tell you on that. Okay. Is this making sort of some sense? If not, yeah. don't worry about it. If you're watching it on the web and you think I'm crazy, just shut it off. That's okay. Delete your subscription. <laughs> we'll be fine. We're going to be here. So I want to show you this, though. That word for life is used 501 times in your Bible. Wow. And the secondary form of that is used 262. That means 763 times just in the Old Testament. Now, I could connect the dots over to when Jesus is talking about life, right? John 10:10, 10, 10, and I've come that they would have life and have it abundantly. Hi. All right, a year for, do you need life? Yeah. I need more real life. That's why we were made for more than just to survive. We were made to thrive. thrive, okay? That's the right kind of life. The problem is, is the enemy always wants to give us a substitute. He wants us to get comfortable instead of leaning into and yoking up with the comforter. Mm -hmm. So we work on our exteriors rather than getting our interior lock nailed down. So let me show you one of the, the next most common word that starts with this, hatath, which is what? Sin, falling short, missing the mark. Now I want you to just see how if God wants to move you into life, what's the thing that he's got to deal with? More than anything else. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Do you begin to understand? See, this isn't like he's bringing this up to rub your nose in it. It's bringing it up because he wants you to see that there's more. Yeah. Okay. Just to help you see, this is, this is my spreadsheet for my going through the 625 different Hebrew words in the Bible that start with this letter. And then I sorted them because there were so many. I went, oh, Lord, this is overwhelming. You got to help me out. Well, you know, if God says something once, it's enough. Twice, it's really important. Three, well, when you get to 763 times, wow. you have my attention. So I sorted these and then grouped them by different categories just to try to understand, Lord, 
out of this, help me make more sense of it. Because I was so overwhelmed by the amount of it. That's all I could do. Hugh will appreciate this. Sort of taking this scientific approach towards the Hebrew number of letters, just because, I mean, number of words, just because there were so many. So, and here's one of the key scriptures that pops up right away with this. You see the word on his arm is sin? This is spoken to who? Cain and Abel, remember that? Mm -hmm. Two sacrifices offered, and one is a little bit ticked off, and the Lord says to him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? In other words, will you not also have life? But listen to this. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over. It's a year for ruling over the sin that wants to have you. Amen. That door is part of that gateway, right? Do you understand that? At the gateway, when you enter, sin will be crouching, looking, and it's going to be a question, who's going to master whom? It wants to master you. You're supposed to rule over it. Make the choice. Okay, are you, you paying attention? So as these new beginnings start to come before you, you've got to be aware, okay, at the gate, what's crouching? How do I deal with it and move forward? Keep going here. Another important word is this word for statute or for law. And you find this thing about uh, 250 times in the two different forms that it's used. Here's an example. Blessed are you, our Lord, teach me your statutes. Do you begin to see already that the Lord's forming a little bit of pattern from the words that he's using most often? You've got life, you've got sin, you've got his statutes. Are they somehow integrated? Okay. Do you understand how you can use the word? How to use the word as a weapon, right? What kind of weapon? Sword. Okay, good. Just keep that in mind. So here's another one. One of the most common words to use with it is the number five. Number five is a word that is tied to what in the Bible? Grace, Grace and mercy. It comes from all sorts of things. We've talked about it before, but I just put in there the stone, the smooth stone. Why? Who am I referencing there? David. David. And how many stones did he have? Five. Okay. And it's also connected to the number of 50. What is the number 50 tied to in Scripture? Jubilee, which is about freedom, right? It's release from debt. It's about getting out from under that burden you're under. Do you see again? It's to get you free back up into life. Yeah. Okay, if I'm making this up, okay. <laughs> then also hesed, which is mercy, right? This is where we feel a lot of times, but God is reaching out in here. And so it's mercy, it's loyal love. Loving kindness is one of the words. Robert Heidler is right, I think. That's kind of, sounds kind of like a Hallmark reading. Right? It really means really intense, loyal love. I won't let you go, Ronnie, no matter how much you muck around. Beat your dog, beat your wife, I'll still love you. Now, I'm going to deal with you on the sin. Yeah, Ronnie doesn't do the, either of those things. Because he doesn't have a dog. No. Um, no, Yvonne, sorry. Just. So here's one. Remember, I had you guys read one of the, for the ping in advance to read Exodus 34 part of that there because that is the place where Moses encounters the glory of God and God passes and hides him in the cleft of the rock and he shows him just his backside and he proclaims his name this is part of that keeping mercy for thousands forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin but the other reason I had you read that is that is is the scholars very clearly from the timing perspective that Moses comes down that mountain on the day of atonement and his face from being in the glory is what? Is glowing. It's like the high priest going in before the presence of the Lord again. And what does God do? He reinforces this mercy. Because in a time when you need life and you've got sin crouching at the door, okay, the statutes are there, the grace is there by the number five, but Hesed, he's just pronouncing it, saying, my mercy will meet you at the gateway. Use my statutes when you're there. To what are you yoked? How are you doing? There's a what there, but it's a how. How do you enter in? How do you cross over it? How do you make the decision not to fall back into fear? Kim and I were dealing with that. Something came up earlier this week, and we just had to go, you know what? We have tried to do that in this way, this way, and this way. We can't, we have to not do that. We have to find a different way through. And so we're in that process now. We're not through it yet. Like, God, we can't keep having this cycle back around. What do you got to do? It's not between us, it's an issue outside of us, but it, it affects us. Okay, God, how are we gonna? You got in this so far? Is it? Okay, I want you to be encouraged by the anchor 
points that I think God's given us this year, because we're going to be coming back to this a lot. This is Koma, which is a wall, a wall of protection. And here's a great scripture for it. For I will be to her, that is Jerusalem, a wall of fire round about her, and I will be the glory in her midst. Do you understand that from the that original Hebrew pictogram being like a fence or a wall, a divider? Do you understand that when God comes, he's got to separate you out from the sin. He's going to do that by his mercy. He's going to do that by the blood. He's going to separate that out so you can rule over it. You can contain it now. And you can step through that gate now. Because he's not. we're not going to get through the day, gate with the old stuff on us. Before every new beginning, that letter het has a seven and a six in it, right? The seven also is seven is a Sabbath day. It's a day of rest. It's a day of death also. You've got to get, Jesus was raised on the eighth day, so we're clear. I know it's the first day of the week, but there was a week before that. And that's why it's a new beginning. Would you say that was a new beginning? <laughs> okay. That was the scripture the Lord gave us when we were buying this house. Not knowing what he was going to do with it. Not knowing at all. We didn't have any clue. We were just buying, you know, it was okay. In fact, it was bought very quickly. We couldn't find a house. Came, Kim drove by here thinking, yeah, right, we don't need a place this big. Stepped up by the threshold and God spoke to her and said, this is it. Discussion was over. Okay, we don't need this much room. Well, we didn't for us, but we did for everybody else. Yeah. God had something much more in mind. Fortunately, he didn't tell us or we would have gone, ah! Okay. Yeah. Now, does this word make sense given everything else we just talked about? About the word, the statutes, about what you're going to have to do about rulership over the sin and everything? It is a year of the sword. This is used, uh, let me just, sorry. I didn't put all the numbers on here because I didn't want you to get overwhelmed with too much information, which I'm already doing. 413 times. Oh, then we'll just take that as a yes. A yes and amen. So here's a word out of Leviticus 26, part of the promise of the Lord. For five of you, there's that number, five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put ten thousand to flight. Yes. Your enemies <laughs> shall fall by the sword before you. Amen. See, I, I want you to get these associations with this year so that you've got access and go, you know what, I'm just going to link into all the promises of God are yes and amen with Jesus. Amen. Agreed? Right? Okay. So then which of the 7,000 are you going to take hold of in this any given time? Okay, I just see this as a way of God pushing us around and just say, pay attention to the Father letter that goes there and the words I'm connecting. Just shh. And if they fit, then, okay. So that's what I've been doing. I've just been looking at the ones that are most, uh, get the most hits on them, I guess, would be the way to say it. Okay, here's another one. The word for strength or to strengthen. Is this making sense as well? You're going to have to strengthen things. And here, say to them that are fearful heart, be strong. Be strengthened. Now here's another one. This word is, is for wisdom. Kokmah. And be wise. Think outside of the box. For wisdom is better than rubies. Nothing you desire can surpass her. Do you see if we're going to be in a war, we're going to use the sword, we're going to have to have strength, and we're going to need discernment. We're going to need the wisdom. We're going to need, by the way, it's not up here, but the word for cunning and to think very carefully through, which is different than wisdom. Wisdom is having this greater. Cunning is this very fine kind of strategy, knowing it. That's part of it. Strategy. Okay. Also, this word is for a force, might, a man of valor, or an army. Do you need an army in this time? Do you need that level of strength? Here, so I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. Who is this talking about? The dry bones. And so it's an army, but what's happened? The breath has gone into them, and what happened? They came alive. Hi. hi ya. <laughs> right? A lot of places you could go where you need to just pray this, Lord. Hi, yeah. Let me just let me just what? raise up an exceedingly great army, right? Most of them are are still stuck. They haven't gotten the wake up call. Do you, do you understand that when Constantine co-opted the church in 325 or so, and he broke off us off from covenantal calendar, and lodged us into the Gregorian into the Roman calendar, we lost so much. 
of what moves in atonement and the understanding of the fall feasts. Okay, we have Easter for Passover. That sort of covers some things. Pentecost Sunday, yeah, really, maybe some places. And then in the fall, there's nada. We have Thanksgiving, which is always good to be thankful but it misses this part of who we are at the core. Yeah, really it misses does. the intimacy and it lets us just stay wandering around in the circles again and again. So, some of you like heard this. So, here was the graphic that James Nesbitt is a friend of ours um, and an ally. He has, Chuck Pierce had him do this for it. So this was the picture. He, had, he went back and forth on different images. So there is that gate and you see there are four, eight lights on the top of it. 5778. So I agree, it is your gates, but you've got to get through it. And again, I'm going to go back to this. Remember, it's a vav, which is six, which is dealing, you can see the sin aspect in that, right? And then you've got the sword, who is also the anointed one. And these are joined, they are yoked together. Okay? And so there it is. That's how you get to this gate, is understanding there's a yoke process here. How am I connected? There's got to be a fresh awareness of that and a fresh willingness to go because it's about life. It's about life. Say it's about life. It's about life. Boy, see, that gate goes to life, but there's a battle at the gate. You have to have the sword. You got to deal with the sin that's crouching there. You're going to need to strengthen. You're going to need to be wise, right? But it's about shutting it down so that door gets closed, the wall of protection comes up around you, that sin is walled off from getting after you, and you can move forward. But it's all about the grace of God meeting us there. Is this kind of connecting? Are you? Okay. You see, my challenge is I, I start looking at this stuff going, okay, God, how do you want to fit this all together? There's a lot of stuff here. And he starts showing me these pieces just out of taking the ones that are used most frequently. So the Day of Atonement then because we're now in the year 5778, I need to understand this Day of Atonement in this way because it's about moving into that deeper place. I mean, it really, think about the Day of Atonement. The high priest moves beyond the veil. Talk about a gate to go through, right? And he goes through, but he goes through for this end. It's to abide in me. If I abide in you and you abide in me, right? Then the life flows. The life flows. But the only way you can abide is by understanding, entering the Holy of Holies as the high priest enters. You see, we get this, we get again, we, well, I got my get out of jail free pass. No, it's an all access pass. There's more than just being out of jail. It's being up into the presence. Yeah? Okay. How are we doing? You okay? Am I giving you too much here? You're still? No. Okay, good. Because see, we have commissionings we have to do tonight. Esther and Gail are heading up to D.C. And Ann and Debbie, Debbie and Ann, are heading off to Cuba. So we're going we're gonna to pray over them and prophesy over them and commission them, which is really, really critical because of what God set in place here, that they move. It's not a matter about me or Kim. It's about what's happening here and how God's aligned it. So... Let me, um, you okay if I little, read a little scripture to you here? Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to take you through some parts of Leviticus 16. Because this is about atonement. And I want you to just hear this setup. Because back in chapter 10, there was a bit of a disaster. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they had offered profane fire before the Lord and died. Do you remember that? It's when they just go on their own. The question about profane fire, what that means, there's a lot of scholarly debate about it, whether they took some from an altar that was actually to an idol. You've got to remember these guys are not that long out of Egypt. Or whether they took it from the altar, but they were drunk. That's the other idea. But see, they were a little too cavalier about getting into the presence of a holy God. Does it remotely sound like any issue we might have today? God is just buddy-buddy rather than, yeah, he's my father, yeah, he's, he just deeply loves me and he even likes me, but he is still holy. That one saying, we have become far too familiar with a God we don't even know. 
So that lesson came. So immediately following that, and the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Guys, if, uh, if we were to send out an email that next week, Sunday at 6 o'clock, the presence of God will show up in Gail's living room. You'd be there, right? And how would you be there, though? Early. 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 <laughs> and would you just kind of walk in drunk? I don't know. I don't think so. No, but I'd leave drunk. Yeah. Uh, you'd probably yeah. leave drunk, yeah, after the presence. But you know what I'm saying? You would be aware that you're entering something sacred, and you would be mindful. You would not be, Lord willing, afraid, but you would not be, hey, how's it happening? You know, you, 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 you'd understand... Okay, God, let me come in. Just I, I want everything you've got. So here's a question. Was that just Old Testament times? Let me give you two names, Ananias and Sapphira. Now, I'll just give you my personal opinion. I think I'm going to get to meet them in heaven one day when I can go up and go, what were you thinking? Because they were in the fellowship of believers. Peter had received revelation from the Lord long before Jesus was raised from the dead, crucified and raised, that you are the anointed one. And then the next month, Jesus says, wow, great job, you got that from my Father in heaven. And the next breath, Peter's rebuking Jesus about going to Jerusalem. He says, get behind me, Satan. Mm -hmm. See, we can traffic in agreement with the enemy, even as believers. Peter did that. Peter ends up doing it again later in the book of Galatians. Paul has to confront him, right? And rebuke him for falling into line with the the circumcision party. Ananias and Sapphira, I think, had given their lives to Jesus but thought that they could play religion. And God has to deal with them. He says, you haven't lied. That money was yours to do with as you pleased. But you have lied to God. So we did, you know, I'm not trying to put fear into God. I'm trying to put an honoring of the fact that he's not a sloppy joke kind of, okay? His, his tenderness, his mercy for us is just, his love for us is so amazing and so intense. But do not presume. Somebody that I think moves pretty powerfully in the Lord, and we talked about daily repentance, and this person just said, no, nah, I never worry about that. I figure if there's something wrong, God will tell me. Oops. I'm like, wow, you're assuming you're going to be able to hear well enough? I mean, I'm just going to, I just confess your sins to one another. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sounds like we're supposed to do a little proactive work on that, you know? And I'm not trying to beat myself up. I just want to keep things candid here. I want to, I want to respect and honor my marriage covenant with Kim in the same way. How am I doing? Am I leaving the seat down or leaving it up? Yeah. Hey, it's the little things. Am I helping? No, really. Am I helping with the dishes? How am, I, how am I honoring her? Where are my eyes go when something comes up on the TV? Am I guarding my heart? Am I walking in that covenant rightly with her? I want that covenant relationship to thrive. I don't want to survive. It's the same way here. How do I keep this so that it's going? Okay. So, thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and the linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore, he shall wash his body and put them on. So this was not just bathing his hands like they would do with the laver out there, but this was his whole body and then he would put on white. Some think that it's because it's not the fancy one that he would wear. He would only wear it on this one day. Some think that it was like a humbling of himself, but some think it's just a reflection of God's holiness. Because you see often angels are dressed in a raiment of white. Okay? And there's something about your entering that. Don't put on any color. Just come in clean and clear. But what's going to happen is he's going to end up taking a pair of goats, right? So, and he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. Okay, so he's got a bull offering, more valuable, 
A goat or a bull? Bull. bull. So here's Aaron. He's the minister, right? And his issues are so big, he's got to use a bull and not just a goat. <laughs> just want you to keep that in mind, right? No matter who you're walking with, who you're following with, whatever they need to do to make sure that their covenant relationship is right with God, you encourage them. Mm -hmm. Well, but that guy's not available any morning until after 10 o'clock. Why? Well, they say he's in there getting time with God. I think he needs to be blah, 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 blah. Paul Young Yi Cho, two hours every single day just in prayer, if not more. You know, he gets to the directions then so he can be more effective in the rest of the time. Yes. So, two goats. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be a scapegoat shall be resented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as a scapegoat into the wilderness. Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and his house. He shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine and bring it inside the veil. And he put, shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side and before the mercy seat. He shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil do with the bull blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meaning which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. You see, one thing Israel always got that we didn't is that they understood, they, they were stuck, unfortunately, with having to do this every year. But they did get that there was a cost of having the Holy God dwell in your midst. You couldn't take it for granted. The blood was always needed. Not to save you, not to get you out of Egypt. That already happened. There was a secondary application which allowed the presence of the Holy God to dwell. And it was still blood-based. Do you get and in the blood is what? The reason God is so strong about the blood is in the blood is the life. We're back to high again. We're back again. We're being yoked to the seven, six to the seven. Humanity to the Savior who died on the cross. It's the yoking. We're yoked into that blood sacrifice so that we can move into the new beginning. We'll skip down here. And when he has made an end of the atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of the meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself and all on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness." Right, so Jesus again, who is our scapegoat? Jesus. I, I don't know that I'm doing an adequate job. I would encourage you to read this and be present with it. I want you to think about being Aaron, who has seen two of your sons killed by God for being cavalier about how they enter the presence. How do you think Aaron was that first time? I think he was once, once a year only. And it was the only time when he was allowed to actually say the name Yahweh. It was considered too sacred. That, see, we, again, I, I don't like getting legalistic, but we, we have this wonderfully intense God 
who is so near and so dear and so funny. I mean, I'm sorry, God says a lot of funny things to me. Sometimes it's about you, but that's okay. Um, no, I mean, not you specifically, but no, I mean, well, you're, you're just right here. So. But, but this, this thing of Aaron coming before and putting, bathing completely and putting on the white, I can't imagine that first thing of going behind the veil going, oh Lord, oh Lord, oh Lord. Right, but okay, I've got the bowl, I got the, I got, you know, man, I'm, I'm not gonna look up at all till I get that incense all over that fire. And now it's all cloudy, okay. I'm still here, right? There, there's, there's just something we miss now as believers not getting that. We, we, we get a certain amount of things done, you know, in the celebration of the crucifixion and the resurrection. But there's more. And in Hebrews it talks about that he has gone through and he's made the way so we can go boldly. But that boldness is not a, how you doing? You know, it, it's not, it is an understanding of the reverence and the compassion. And there are times when he'll be that cavalier with me and he'll come to me in that way and be joking and everything else. But I can't presume how to do that. So this whole thing of the gates, when we were at, um, I'll do one more thing here. So the question to me is, is to whom or to what are you yoked? I need you to see the yoke is not just this animal thing, but it's how are you connected? How are you holding on? Understanding the power delta. To whom or what are you yoked, okay? You can't get through a gate under an old yoke. I'm just trying to tell you, you're gonna have to make sure, am I fully yoked with Christ in this? What has to die? Christ is both the lamb and Christ is the lion. What from the lamb side needs to be dealt with? What from the lion side do I need in courage and strength? Do I understand he has what I'll need? I'll be strengthened. I've got the sword, I've got the statutes, it's the mercy of God, I've got the five smooth stones. All this stuff is working. And then here's another one, how well are we yoked? Is that attachment good or is it pretty frail? And as soon as something comes up, that's what I was dealing with with Kim and me, with this thing that came up and we both got a little bit of fearful and I had to go, you know what, God, I can't do that. I'm yoked with you. You're the lion, you're the big one, I'm this little one. I'm yoked with you, I'm gonna just, you, you carry it, but I'm gonna stay with you. That's my fight, is not to push through the burden as much as to push through to hold on to him because I wanna do it on my own and in my own way and my own time, thank you very much. And this one, how are we yoked? Are we hearing the same sound? See, this couple is yoked. They, they're on the same page. They're hearing the same sound. What are you hearing? That will change your yoking, right? Hello? Some of you have seen that in marriages. You're listening to different voices. Some of you have issues in marriage even though you're both believers because one wanted to go off the spirit and one didn't. Hearing a different sound, not yoked together. Are we hearing what the Lord is hearing? If I'm yoked to seven, to the crowned one, that will get me through the gate. And then when we were at, at Glory of Zion, I may have mentioned this to some of you, but the first day I was there, I kept getting a picture of, of the Lion of Judah, and I was right before him, and he was, he was breathing and blowing on me. I don't quite know how to describe it, but it was, you know, when you, when you blow, it tends to be cool, and when you breathe, it's hot. Well, this was like hot blowing, okay? So it was somewhere in between. But he was doing that, and I kept trying to figure, what are you doing, what are you doing? And I got the sense that he was, he was trying to pull off this stuff from the old seasons, plural, not just seasons, seasons that I needed to release so I could move forward. And then I kept looking at this picture and over time it became very clear and I actually did release this prophetically there that I feel on the other side of the gate is the lion and he's the blowing through. That's not just glory there, that's his hot breath. And it's saying not only that he's got to blow that off you but it's literally I saw it coming into me and it was taking out parts of my flesh, parts of my DNA that were corrupted from old seasons and just pulling him out. If I would let him, if you would follow me, you must take up your cross daily, okay? That's the yoking. Come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. This is about life. Strive, therefore, to enter into that rest. 
There's a way that we have to enter into the gate. It's not going to be about a fight through the gate as much as it is to deal with our stuff, deal with the sin crouching to the door, take the sword, use the statutes, wall it off, be strengthened, be wise, be cunning, see what it is there, get yoked more tightly to him, and then just walk through it. Is that enough of a how? Or is that just too... whatever. That was a lot of stuff. Okay. So, 5778. Hi, life. Hiya, living. <laughs> okay, I'm sure I'm obliterating those in the Hebrew. So, anybody who's watching this and thinks, oh, he stinks as a Hebrew scholar, that's fine. I'm not trying to get, because what's funny is different scholars will tell you different ways on how it's to be pronounced. I'm either. But what I want you to get is new beginning, the gate, and then all these other words that will help you get there. You might have to rewatch parts of this. You might have to do some word study on your own. Blue Letter Bible is a great source for that. How many of y'all want a new beginning? Yes. yes. Okay. How many of you need to get through a gate? Yes. Okay. Just bear in mind, I think this is really, this is not about a single gate. I think there's going to be a lot of new beginnings. Could be in relationships, could be in work, could be in spirituality. It may be in a different fellowship. We're constantly asking you, make sure with God, you're still supposed to be here. We love having you on the deck, okay, and being part of this carrier. But if you're supposed to be somewhere else, you're AWOL, okay? <laughs> Make sure you're assigned. We, we, we want to have you here, but only if you're under orders from the king. And it's right. If your assignment's changed, then great. Let us just pray over you and commission you and send you out. We don't hold you. Honor and freedom is the platform here. Father God, I now ask that this word would get pressed down and the images would get pressed down. It was a whole lot of stuff, Lord. It's taking a sip out of a fire hose. But Lord, you are that water, that living water that they're sipping. And Lord, that means that they're going to be able to take what you give them down deep into their core, down to their bone marrow and let it shift them. Lord, I'm just going to bless them that this year is about life. It's about life. It's about life. Lord, there's freedom here. There is so much where we can master the sin that wants to master us. We can bring the sword against it. We'll bring the statutes. Lord, we will get protected. You are the wall of fire around us. You are the one to whom we are yoked. You have made the provision so we can enter into the holy of holies. We love you. We serve you. We honor you. We seal this word now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.